All good? Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thank you. So uh, I mean, uh, just to put some stuff in context, you know, Elvis did a good uh, round introduction, introducing me. So I'm just going to kind of skip to that very quickly. I just want to point out that, you know, along this journey, academic journey, I also got probably around seven to 10 years experience of software development, software engineering and architecture. So that comes in handy when we talk about the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So yeah, so he pointed out we released the social media mining toolkit and also we released a very big data set on COVID data. So, you know, that's basically what you see. And I like to call it uh, kind of colloquially as, you know, you see what you need, you, that's the sausage, right? That's what you see. But usually, rarely, you don't see how the sausage is made. And this is basically what I'm going to talk about today. So just to kind of start, you know, obviously, this came out a few years ago, but it's very, pre pre I mean, it's very important up until now. You know, the data is basically the world's most valuable resource, right? It's the new oil. So getting access to data is one thing. Uh, collecting your own data is a different thing. And also, you know, uh, being able to use that data is the most important part, right? Because everybody claims to have a bunch of data, and a lot of people do, but generating uh, insightful things out of it is where the challenge is. Is where, you know, you kind of separate the people that know versus the people that say they do. So let's talk about this thing to start with, right? So if you notice, I didn't use big data on my topic. I used large scale. Because, you know, big data kind of is like the jargon to impress people. So if I wanted to submit a grant, I'll probably write big data a bunch of times. If I want to talk about research, I'll mostly talk about large scale because obviously, you know, there's very different interpretations of that, right? It could be 10 gigabytes for some people, that's big data. For other people, it's 100 gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes. So it's, it's it, it varies widely, right? And because this is not the same thing for, you know, computer scientists or physicists, social scientists, medical researchers. So it depends on what field you're working with and who you're working with. You know, I've been told that 100 observations of something is there's a lot of data. Or I've been in the side where, you know, uh, you have petabytes of genomics information that is not really that much data because, you know, it only covers a, a few thousand people. <laughs> so having this in a context is very important. And that, you know, all the work that we do and then the work that I try to instill in people, it's mostly based on this thing called the KISS principle, right? So it's, this is a principle that was noted by the U.S. Navy in the 60s. That's, you know, where it kind of came up. What it means, keep it simple, stupid. I know it might sound harsh, but it's not, right? It's the notion that, you know, whatever you do, however you try to do things, try to keep them always simple, right? Overly complicated things, this extremely uh, verbose and, you know, over the top things. I mean, they're cool and everything, but, you know, if you want people to use things, if you want to reach a broader audience, you have to keep things simple. Otherwise, it's just going to get, you're going to narrow your, your scope or your focus too much. So here, you know, I'm talking about, you know, the best practices, you know, on how to build something. So I'm going to talk about from the perspective of, you know, how do we go about, uh, at least in, in my opinion, in my lab and in my work, you know, how do we go about building things? And then I'm going to put it up, uh, put the examples up of the social media mining toolkit and the COVID data set to you kind of contextualize what stuff I'm going to be talking about. So a lot of people want to start, you know, you, you're assigned by somebody, your boss, your professor or anybody, you know, that uh, is supervising you or your friends, you know, in a, in a class project, whatever. So everybody always wants to do, oh, let's use the most hype tool. Let's use whatever is cool now, I guess, you know, hugging face transformers or whatever. It's, you know, just coming out that everybody wants to use G, uh, that the new GP3, uh, three, anything, right? And all state of the art I can find. Is that really the way to go about things? Well, not always. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, using the, the best and the most complex might not yield the best solution, but it might not yield, you know, the most, uh, the most impactful or relevant solution. So here, you know, I try to recommend always, you know, you want to identify the scope of the problem. You know, how much data are we talking about? Again, you know, you're not going to build this ridiculous cluster of 100 nodes and 10 petabytes of storage 
where your use case or the scope of the problem it's you know a hundred people or uh, data on a hundred people or if it's you know a very limited set who's going to use the data is very important right you're not going to build this highly complicated system that you can access on a console or you know via terminal when you're going to give it to a clinician or when you're going to give it to a social scientist right you're not going to build this crazy tool with two billion features you know that it's really not gonna be used ideally also how they're gonna use data right it's very different when somebody wants data in excel sas versus when somebody wants you know data frames or anything a sql database so make sure that all this is clear obviously you know do you need a cloud-based solution most people are using the cloud now you know not always it's needed at least in my research lab using the cloud will be prohibitively expensive because of all that extra added cost that a lot of people don't think about, like just transferring data in and out. That that multiplies the cost, and actually we ended up paying more on data transfer costs than actually hosting and processing. So obviously, you know, you want to know what where you want to go. Important stuff when you're building toolkits and frameworks, you want to avoid scope creep. What is this? Well, it's basically, you know, it's called requirement creep or kitchen sink syndrome, where awesome, right? I mean, you're this brand new computer scientist, brand new scientist, and you, you learn all these methods, all these technologies. I want to put all of it into everything that I do. Well, you know, you really don't want to do that. And that's usually the case. I don't know if you've seen, I mean, there's a lot of tools out there that do, you know, 45 different things, but usually the tools that are, that are more used and more impactful are the tools that do one thing very, very well. You know, you don't want to have over engineer things. Also, importantly enough, very important, you know, you want to know who your audience is. So basically, you know, if you're, you know, setting up a framework or tools, like I was mentioning earlier, is very different between fields. Like, for example, solar physicists that I used to work with, they did all the programming in IDL and we developed all the systems that were on Python. Well, that's bad, right? Uh, uh, when you're working with social scientists, a lot of them want to do data analysis and SAS, SPSS, or even Excel. And that's perfectly fine. You don't have to be using Pandas or, you know, Spark or anything when you don't have that much data. And also, you don't want to disrupt people's workflows, right? And biologists, I, I find that this, that a lot of them still do all this gnarly scripting in Perl. Well, you know, you want to know your audience. So if I release a tool for biologists, you know, I want it to be able to interface with what they use rather than what you think they use. So you, and then this is, you know, a software engineering principle, right? So now that, you know, the heavy lifting is done, knowing those main things is what's going to make your tool or process or framework successful. If you don't, if you ignore them, then, you know, you're going to have some other issues to deal with later. So now that we have that out of the way, Let's start with, you know, the fun stuff, right? How about, you know, finding the right tool for the job? So always ask, right? I know that everybody wants to use TensorFlow, or you want to use Transformers, or you want to use whatever it's the latest and greatest. Always ask, do I really need the capabilities of this, right? Do I need the capabilities of Hadoop to do, I don't know, 100,000 rows of data? Not quite, right? So always think about, you know, what you're trying to use. I mean, there's all this cool stuff. And, and uh, trust me, I, I've been down a lot of rabbit holes trying all these cool things, trying to make them work with my pro uh, problem just because, you know, I want to learn them. But also when, you, when uh, other people depend on what you're building, you might not want to, you know, force people to change their, their workflows. Always define a scalable architecture. This is more than relevant now. Right. I mean, not everything needs a database uh, or if it does need a database, you want SQL, no SQL graph. Always have this stuff, you know, ironed out at the beginning, changing things. And I'll talk about this later, you know, uh, downstream. It's a lot harder than, you know, doing it right since the beginning. Do you need the data lake? This is very popular now instead of a data warehouse or a bunch of databases, you know, a data lake where you can have flat files, where you can have databases, when you can have graph graphs, knowledge graphs. This is, you know, uh, at least the, the, most of the stuff that I've done the last few years is moving to this direction. Also, do you want a search engine, right? If you have something that involves a lot of text data, you might want to have all this stuff indexed, you know, like an Elasticsearch or, 
anything that allows you to get results quick. But also it's use case dependent, right? And also, do you really need, you know, real-time pipelines to process stuff like Pig, Hive, and all these things that companies like, you know, Facebook or companies that actually do have a lot of real-time data coming in use? Uh, in a lot of scenarios, you don't. And this is where, you know, a lot of people, you know, we're made to teach a lot of these things in school, but a lot of people don't get the point that, you know, all these tools and all this stuff that you learn in school is usually a toy example. The focus that you should have is on, you know, when you're deploying things or when you're trying to produce something. Iterative development is something that I always advocate for, you know, always keep, you know, you start with your plan, you do the requirements, analysis, design, you implement, and you keep testing and you keep evaluating and you keep refining things. Almost nothing is going to be static anymore. Almost nothing, you know, it's not going to change, especially now that you want to build in some new technologies or something that will improve your process, right? Don't build stuff into it just because it's new build stuff into it because it's better so okay so now that i bored you enough with some more high level kind of philosophical principles let's talk about you know how does this this in, in the context of actual tools and actual things that we built so first i'm going to go back a little bit and you know why do we want to use social media data right obviously everybody knows i'm pretty sure every single person here is in a social network even just by joining Meetup, you are in a social network. So this is, you know, this is the way people are connecting now. So why do we want to do this? Why do we want to use this type of data? Well, we have large amounts of data. We want large amounts of data. Obviously, social media generates terabytes of data almost per second now. So there is the access there. We want timely data, right? We want to know what's going on now, what's going on, that, not real time, but maybe near real time. So social media is the best. If you're waiting for like, you know, academic publications, well, that's going to have a, a lag of several weeks to months. If you're waiting for, you know, well, not preprints anymore, but still other, you know, peer review things. Uh, even the news has a lag of, you know, hours uh, for certain things. We want data that can't be found in traditional systems. And this is, you know, well, one of the most powerful things to social media. A lot of the stuff people talk about and we talk in social media, is stuff that we don't talk about, you know, uh, with our doctor. So that's not documented on an EHR system or in legal registries. You know, you don't go to the DMV and tell them that, you know, you like this car because it's super cool and has all these features, right? But you go to a forum or Facebook or Twitter to say that you bought this car because it's super cool and all those things. So all that, that information, you know, you're not going to be able to find it anywhere if you're looking at, you know, persons, right? But however, you uh, anywhere else other than in social media. So that's the goal that it's there to be extracted. Obviously, there's a lot of privacy stuff, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later. But, you know, that's the reason you want to have social media data because it's recent, it's a lot of it, and it's data that you won't find anywhere else, uh, you know, if, if uh, assuming you had access to all the data in the world. And all these social media companies got really smart about it, right? Because now they're mine. Absolutely every single thing you do is recorded. So, uh, and, you know, and that's their business model, basically. It's you. And we want data that is voluntarily provided by the user, too. You know, I don't want to be snooping in your phone calls. I don't want to be snooping in your conversations. Well, even though Alexa might do some of that stuff, you know, uh, but still, you know, I want stuff that you reported that you put out there publicly. So you, so there's no, you know, so there's some sort of transparency in the sense that, you know, I'm not going behind people's backs to get data. However, if you volunteer it and I mind it, well, you know, it's already on my data set. Cautions about, you know, social media data, privacy. This is a very, very big one, right? Uh, a lot of people might not understand. Now it's changing. Now people are more cognizant of what they're sharing. People in Europe especially are better informed that like, I would say people in Latin America or American in general as a continent. But, you know, people are starting to turn off that, you know, GPS all the time. They're starting to turn off, share your location. They're starting to turn off things. You stop putting your birthday on your Facebook account. So, you know, people are starting to get better at this. Permanence. That's also caution in the sense that, okay, in Twitter, 
if you get upset one day, you get upset at some troll that's just trolling you too hard, you can delete your Twitter account and that data is gone, right? Twitter is very good uh, about that. It's bad for researchers, but it's good for people, right? In the sense that you delete your stuff and your tweets don't appear. If I download the data set that included some of your tweets, but you deleted your account, I cannot retrieve them back anymore. So, you know, so if there's a, if there's a list of your tweet, tweet IDs and you deleted your account or you made your account private, I can't go and get it anymore. So, you know, that's good and bad. Uh, the permanence of it is good and bad. Also, you know, if you were, if you're writing on a forum that just goes out of business or goes offline, then that date is gone. So that's uh, so cautious about trying to, you know, always think that the tap is going to be open. Veracity, this is the biggest one, right? I can just say that I own 17 planes on Twitter. Is that going to make it true? Probably not, right? So I know I, attributing this data or whatever statements or things people are saying, it's also hard. Right. And it's a caution, but you know, I mean, it's, it's a necessary evil, right? I can also go to my clinician and tell him that I'm, you know, that, that I've been not smoking, even though I smoke two packs a day, that there's uh, the veracity is, you know, it's not there yet. It's not there either, but you know, at least in social media, people being anonymous, people being, you know, uh, anywhere or people having multiple troll accounts can write whatever crap they want. And it's up to the researcher or whoever is doing work with that data to decide if it's you know real or not. And doing this at scale, it's a huge problem. So why Twitter? Let's talk about you know what about using Facebook data? Well, that's in strictly against the terms and conditions to scrape. And Facebook, after the Cambridge Analytica stuff, got really picky and is very very paranoid about this, and they enforce it well. What about Reddit data? Well, depending on the subreddit, there's not enough. Uh, I do research on aging and you know elderly populations. The the subreddits about that are very small. However, on Twitter, people talk about it on a daily basis. Uh, obviously, there's other subreddits that are there's a lot of data coming in every day. There's a lot of them are not. What about forums? Well, the problem with forums is that yeah, they're all cool. A lot of them are behind paywalls. A lot of them are behind you know. Uh, different structures. So if there was only one forum software that structured the data the same way throughout the world, that would be awesome, but not. So if you're trying to mine data from here, you're going to have to set up a bunch of crawlers in different ways. The data is going to come formatted differently. You know, you, you, you start to make yourself, get yourself in a mess. And also there's a lot of privacy concerns, right? A lot of people go to forums, especially like the self-help forums, like you know the addiction forums to post things that you know they feel personal they just want to put them there in a community that's you know sort of limited uh, right and then you go and, and take all of that and you know make your own analysis out of it well that's you know a little bit iffy also a lot of the forums do explicitly say do not mind this data however most people don't read that what about Weibo, Pinterest, and all these other you know social networks? Well, yeah, they're nice, they're cool, but for example, for Weibo, it's only a, a, it's not a small subset of the population, but it surely is a subset of the population, right? It's not very representative. Also, Pinterest has a certain target audience, and all these other more specialized networks. So that's why we pick Twitter, but we're not saying I'm not saying that you should not pick all these other ones, right? Because your use case or your application or your intention might be completely different. On Twitter, you know, we do a lot of health related research. So we're trying to push this and we've seen that, you know, the community itself is starting to use Twitter and there's publication numbers of, uh, of you know, papers that mention Twitter and health related questions on PubMed are, is growing every year. Also the benefits, like I mentioned, you know, there's a good population representation. So the age, level, age groups are kind of nicely distributed. The, it represents multiple countries. The anonymity that uh, that people get there uh, allow us to get you know very unfiltered opinions, which are which is terrible if you're reading tweets, but it's good because you get honest opinions. The data is freely available. I'll talk a little bit more about that. There's around you know hundreds of millions of tweets generated every day, so you have a constant stream of data coming in, and you can filter them somewhat easily with hashtags, mentions, and I'll get a little bit more into that when I talk about actually how to set this up. So traditional disadvantages and data is super messy. 
Uh, we do a lot of drug safety stuff or drug safety analysis on this, or at least trying to extract drugs. And uh, at least for this very popular drug that everybody knows about now because of COVID, you know, uh, hydroxychloroquine is misspelled at least 25 different times. So, you know, that's hard to handle, right? And also we have a paper, a preprint of a paper that we've shown that if you ignore misspellings, you are leaving on the table 15% or more of the data. So that's a big chunk, right? Especially when you get na when you narrow down your research scope to something very small. Anyways, attribution, like I mentioned, all the freely available data is only 1% of the sample. Of course, Twitter gives you a little taste. And if you want a lot more, you have to pay. Uh, collection is hard. And this is something that, you know, we address in my toolkit. And, and I'll talk about it later. But because you need to have this ongoing for days, weeks before you get considerable mass and actually be able to do anything with that data. It has very unique challenges. And this is from, you know, the NLP machine learning perspective, this short form text. So you can't really use a lot of those, you know, nice uh, uh, tools built on, you know, full text of thousands of pages. Uh, it's more colloquial. It's very ambiguous and expressive. So, you know, a lot of these NLP tools that you see, a lot of them, or most of them, at least up until the last couple of years, didn't work on emojis, right? That stuff was just parsed out. However, a lot of the stuff on social media, the, the emojis actually, you know, what could change the polarization of any sentence or can, can change the meaning of what you're reading. So, you know, all this stuff needs to be addressed. So how do we harness, you know, such data? So, well, you can start by downloading an already created data set. And usually, you know, this is the way that I, I like to tell people when somebody says, oh, I want to do this. The first thing that I send them to do is, okay, fine. Go and look if there's nobody else that already did this in the sense of gathering the data. You'll be amazed on how much other people are doing. And with enough, you know, Google ninja skills, you'll be able to find it and be able to use it. So you can already, you know, to use this data, you can download something that's already created. Fine. There's nothing there. Like, for example, our use case that I'll talk about later on of COVID, right? Cool. So how do we get our own data? So obviously, you know, if we're, uh, most people here, I assume a lot of them are computer scientists, you know, so being a computer scientist for you, using API calls, using this, you know, getting tokens and using get requests and this kinds of things, are not a problem. However, most people using actual, you know, social science research, uh, health sciences, healthcare research on this, have no freaking idea how to do this. Obviously, there's some tools, but a lot of those tools and the majority of those tools are built by computer scientists. Therefore, you know, we have a very peculiar way of thinking and of doing things that other domain or people in other domains don't. So we decided to think, okay, fine. So we have all these things that we want to do. There's a lot of ways to do it. Obviously, I'm not saying that, you know, there were no tools that did similar things. There, there were no tool or a set of different tools that you can put together to do what we wanted. But, you know, we thought, well, oh, maybe we do need a specific tool. So now, you know, this is, uh, now I'm actually getting into talking about this uh, tool that we released. That is the Social Media Mining Toolkit. Uh, there's some links there. Uh, the slides will be uploaded somewhere, I'm sure. If not, just Google it. And I think, luckily, it's the first thing that comes up. So how did we uh, stumble upon no, uh, thinking that we need this thing? So let's start. So I assigned a simple task to three of my students, where we basically got, here's the 60 gigabyte JSON file with several million tweets. One collaborator gave it to me. So I asked the students, I'm like, cool, let's see what people, I mean, how do people do, right? How do people do things and what things they do? So I asked them how many tweets we have. Uh, just tell me the number. Tell me how many unique users we have in that file and separate, you know, all the tweets by identifier, date, text, and user. So, you know, very basic, very trivial task that you might think, oh, yeah, this is, you know, cake. Anybody can do that. The only requirements that I gave to people were you have to use Python uh, and you have to give me a TSV or tab delimited file with the format, you know, tweet ID, date, user, and text. That's it. So that seems like, you know, something trivial, right? Well, what do you guys think? You know, did everybody return with the same answers? Shocker. No. Wait, isn't everybody using the same file? Yes. 
not a single answer match between three people. And these three people had, you know, undergraduate degrees in computer science at least. So, huh, weird. Interestingly enough, two people even used the same code base they found on the internet to do the task. And still, their answers did not match. So obviously, there's something wrong about this, right? Then there's obviously a need that, you know, there's a need to standardize this process. So we go back to what I talked about at the beginning in the sense that, fine, we identify the scope of the problem. We need to process the data in a standard way. And this is thinking this tool originally was internal for my lab, but we ended up releasing it because I shared it with other people. They like it. They shared it with other people. They liked it. So we just decided, well, why not get some you know, citation credits on it? and also help out other people you know that want to use it so we need to process the data in a standard way right uh, i should not assign i should not be assigning a task to three people that are going to get and then and where i'm going to get three different answers why because if this is research work reproducibility you can't reproduce the results of any of them or every time that you reproduce try to reproduce something you will get a different answer that's really bad we need to be able to get data so fine you know I'm saying, okay, let's put all this stuff that we need to do together to build a tool for it. So I identify the scope of the problem. We want data in standard way. We want to be able to get data and we want to be able to use the data for typical NLP tasks like annotation, like, you know, whatever, generating counts, biograms, trigrams, whatever you want. We don't want to have to, you know, we want to avoid scope creep. We don't want to put everything in the kitchen sink in this tool. We do not want to build an M a machine learning package, right? There's already hundreds of them. We do not want to rebuild functions for Twitter calls in the sense that, okay, there's this low level API calls that there are other software, other packages that handle this well. We want to, you know, not reinvent the wheel. We do not want to build our own NLTK or Spacey-like tool. Why? Because NLTK and Spacey are pretty good. There's no point in building all this stuff that somebody else built just because you want to call your tool the one-stop shop that does everything. Those kinds of tools never really work. So we want, we first, uh, and this is where, you know, we spend a little time thinking, okay, we want to know your, uh, know our audience, right? Ideally, CS people, however, you know, social scientists, informaticians, you know, have these issues. You can see it all over the internet. You can go to Stack Overflow and see, oh, all these people are asking the same thing and they come from different domains. You can see all these random snippets of code everywhere provided by people from different, you know, areas. So we need to make this as easy as possible to use, which, you know, this is something, this is famous last words for a lot of people. Most people expect that they, whatever they do is going to fall in this place, but it ends up not being that way, right? So, you know, after talking to many people in different domains, we notice that, you know, a lot of people do not know how to use programs that encapsulate details of the process. And this is kind of counterintuitive, right? Why? Because, yeah, you want to encapsulate as much as you can to give just one call to do something. But a lot of people don't really get what's going on and tweaking something or if there's an error. And uh, the more encapsulated something is, uh, at least for scientists in different domains, not layman people, I guess, you know, uh, the, the more you obscure things and make it harder for people to use. However, you know, we found after, you know, I talked to a lot of people, I made a little poll, you know, uh, that everybody does know how to run and change scripts, which, you know, uh, I guess is kind of the, the part of the practice now where you go to Stack Overflow, put a little piece of code and try to change it. So, you know, that kind of mentality, a lot of researchers do it. Uh, I've done it. Many people will still keep doing it. So we wanted to build a tool that kind of had this, you know, bake in there. And also, you know, we, in order to solve that other factor of, you know, finding the right tool for the job, we use Python. Python is free. It comes to install with, in, in most Linux distributions. It comes to install in a Mac. So, you know, and many people outside of the U.S. have started to use it. All this data science uh, trends are moving to people to use Python. One of the biggest things we did, we want to define a scalable architecture, right? And this is where you need to think a little bit big, right? We want to build a toolkit that grows. I mean, now it only works for Twitter. However, you can basically uh, add on for, you know, Reddit and all this other stuff <coughs> where we just have, you know, three different blocks that make our tool. 
the data acquisition tools, which is, you know, a lot of different little scripts that allow you to do data acquisition for Twitter, like, you know, hydration, scraping, and all those things. Pre-processing tools where, you know, it would allow you to parse JSONs and separate them. And again, you know, this seems seem very trivial, but it was actually, when you start, when you move into this space uh, as a CS person, it's hard to find all this in one place. And also uh, imagine somebody outside of CS where, you know, you're just completely lost. And also we want data annotation and standardization tools where we can use, you know, ter terminologies, dictionaries, do name entity recognition and standardize all the outputs to stuff like, you know, Brat or, you know, pub annotation and all these other tools that are already there to use. So if you notice, we're not scope creeping on anything. We just focus on, you know, functional, quick and well separated. So in the end, you know, so we released this tool. What do we learn about this? The tool was for internal usage, but we decided to release it publicly. One very important thing is that we don't have fancy wrappers for everything. So everybody's obsessed with making this very compact Python packages, which is okay and it's fine. I have nothing against them. But you know, when you want to reach a broad set of people and when you want people to, you know, grow with your tool in a way or, you know, build around it, you know, uh, tight integration is a lot harder to decouple than, you know, something that's kind of loose. Uh, but we have everything look, but at least, you know, at least in our tool, you know, you know where to find the things that you're looking for. And while seemingly primitive, you know, it has been able to be used by people in multiple domains with minimal hassle. Uh, whenever I go and try to shop this tool around, I kind of sit down to people and tell them, okay, here's the repo show me how will you use it and you know i go through the motions so all the well, all the stuff that i've seen that's you know block people over time i kind of bake in and prove in the tool to this adaptable in the sense that you know you can just change the code files to your liking right if you have a very uh, compact package you can install via pypy or whatever uh, taking those things apart it's increasingly difficult the more complex they become versus just having you know a lot of files there that each file does a specific thing where you can just say yeah i'm going to take this file i'm going to take this piece from this file and paste it with the piece from the other file to do my own workflow my own pipeline so that's what we wanted we didn't want you to have mm -hmm. users to be you know <laughs> scrambling around to uh, patch a lot of different tools we just wanted you know to use the, the code on the thing and it reduces the learning curve to start using Twitter data. And now that with the COVID data set that we released, a lot of people came out of the woodworks. They wanted to do Twitter data and COVID. So when we provide this tool, you know, people are actually qu get quicker up to speed about, you know, just pulling the data they need and doing the analysis versus spending weeks or months trying to figure out how to get the data the right way. So nice. So, you know, okay, fine. So how do you set up, you know, now we have a tool that does a lot of the social media mining stuff. You can do a large scale or not. How do we set up, you know, a framework? And this is where I make the difference between a tool and a framework. A framework is basically, you know, the set of steps or at least a set of procedures that you want to do or dictate to, you know, follow to do something. So, you know, how do we set up a framework for collecting data, right? So I mentioned the Twitter data and this is the, the, the good and bad, right? They have this, uh, the free, AP, uh, free, Firehose or whatever they call it now, where there's constant 1% of their Twitter feed is coming out of it for free. However, you know, it's the more you can grab or, you know, uh, as and as long as you can, it wins. So you need to have a very good framework to be able to mine this data and to be able to collect it first. So for the COVID pandemic, you know, we release, you know, using our tools, we release this big data set of you know now is 513 million tweets it's only covid related chatter and it has been downloaded over 23,000 times i think by the end of today uh so it's you know it's a tool that people use or a, a resource that people use it has a bunch of languages it has you know you have nice visualizations of it you have you know different versions of the data set it has geolocations it has you know locations uh, place locations enable so for NLP users, we provide top, you know, 100,000 frequent terms, bigrams, trigrams. So this is nice and cool. Why do we provide these things? Well, because if, if you know Twitter data, we cannot share 
the full Twitter object or the text or all the particular, all the tweet, the complete tweet with you per Twitter's developer, you know, in terms of in terms, of, uh, terms and conditions. So you have to hydrate it. So in order to do quick things, you know, we can share some aggregate statistics. So we share this stuff in order for people that want to just use, uh, you know, bigrams, tigrams, so those type of things, uh, the quick things that you want to do. So that's nice. Okay, so this data set sounds cool, awesome, but how do we actually get there? At how do you how can you produce a data set like that? Well, you know, you need to define a framework for data collection, and in this sense, you know, you need to know, and this is the best starting point. You need to know what data you want and how to get it. On Twitter, you know, you can use hashtags or keywords to filter the data, or you can just grab all and then filter it later. But if you do this, you're gonna be losing uh, you're going to be getting data that is not relevant and you and that data that you didn't get because you did you get other data obviously you have you know network connectivity limits on the twitter api so you're going to be you know not getting the right data so you can filter it by hashtags or keywords by language location obviously there's a lot of details here that are kind of high level touch but you can do that at some point Right, so you want to know for so for at least for this, you know, we had the COVID hashtags, or you know, coronavirus when it was starting. So this is how you know you kind of funnel the 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 fire hose of water. You kind of funnel it into the the parts that you're interested in. So you know, you play around with this to maximize your data gathering in the sense that you can go to Twitter and then type in a hashtag, and if the hashtag has you know ten tweets, then obviously that's not a very popular hashtag. But if you have a ha if you put a hashtag and it has millions of tweets and it has tweets every second, then you probably want to use that to collect the most. You need to have a vision, you know, how long will you be doing this? And this is very important, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, nobody foresaw, or well, at least a lot of people didn't foresaw, uh, foresee that, you know, this pandemic was going to be at least going into the hundreds. And now we're in 120 some days, you know, since it was declared a pandemic. Uh, you know, seven months since it started in China. So, you know, have a, uh, you need to have a vision on how much you want to collect this. So since the start, we said, fine, we want to collect this and up until, you know, at least one year after the pandemic ends. So we kind of had, you know, some rough estimates and, and decided to architect something to be able to hold all of that. And it's very important thing that, you know, you have your early decisions will be very hard to fix later. So if we decided to collect data wrong, that will we can't fix that if you decide to store the data incorrectly you know well you can kind of fix that right you can always add more hard drives you can always compress things so that's something you can fix but always keep it simple right you don't try to overcomplicate it over engineer things you know how do you check you know you want to check the infrastructure you have at your disposal and pick an architecture at least for our collection we have a data lake and i'll talk i'll talk about under the hood in in, in a few in a couple minutes uh, but we want this because of the flexibility and scale that allows us, right? In a daily lake, we can just add another, you know, uh, network attached storage device and put more data in it, and it integrates with everything else. If we have a big database, uh, you know, a central monolithic database, it will be a lot trickier to add disk, and then, you know, we need to shard the data later. So it, it becomes complicated. Again, I, I like to keep things simple. Optimize all your processes iteratively. And obviously you start, the data keeps piling in. You're just, you know, trying to get by at first. After a while, you get a handle of it. You start, you know, optimizing. And you see, so you know, you, you want to aim to solve the need at hand with consideration of how this will work when you have 10x or 100x data, right? And this is where it's hard to plan at the beginning or when you're not used to working this way. Why? Because it's always easy. Oh, I have... 500 gigabytes of RAM, I can just load everything in RAM. Well, it will get to the point that you will not be able to load 500 gigabytes in RAM, then what, right? So you, you need to think about that since the beginning or at least, you know, over time, so you start optimizing your processes. So under the hood of how we collect the data, this data set and the infrastructure we use, you know, we have this big research server, you know, where we have all the threads, almost, you know, seven, six, uh, 768 gigs of RAM, all this hard drive. So we have a beefy computer. It doesn't mean that, you know, you need a beefy computer. You can also, I shifted this for a few weeks to a, a cloud VM under the, the free tier. 
and you can still do the same, right? You, I won't be able to do the processing the same at the same speed, but I'll be able to do the collection at least. So know that your architecture, you know, could play with. Now we have, you know, around 520 million tweets, which are uh, in daily one object files. They're JSON objects. If you do the math, you know, we have around 2.5 terabytes of uncompressed data. All our scripts, and this is, you know, my, what might shock some people, we only have Python and Bash scripts and some visualization stuff in R. We're not using Dask. We're not using, you know, uh, what is a Spark or anything like that. We started with something simple. Uh, we fit and, and we've been, you know, parallelizing it. We've been optimizing it to, for it to still scale better without the need of a tool that, you know, at first, if you want to, if you're starting this and you want to use Dask, but you don't know how to use Dask, you don't want to be learning on data that you know you need to be uh, that is that you need to be relying on so that's why you know keep it simple we use bare bones things obviously we can tweak it we're looking into you know yeah and doing other pipelines but for now you know for the functional aspect of things this just works and we can process the whole data set in parallel in about 150 minutes and this is going line by line so that's pretty fast obviously because we have a big computer we can paralyze this but still you know i mean that is something that you architect for so there's no need really you know if i can reparse everything you know i don't have a need of you know having something very uh, uh, this convoluted piece of software to do it we have a data lake architecture. We have all the raw files compressed. We split the data into clean and retweets. So retweets are around 60 to 70% of Twitter. And all this day, and the retweets are usually the stuff that's, you know, all the trolls, the bots, and people not saying anything or much. Uh, we keep daily tracks of, you know, um, everything is still broken down by days. We keep daily tracks of things like mentions, hashtags, emojis, languages, and locations for some visualization stuff. But so we have those things stored as separate files, but always by a date. We have an immediate master TSV file that, you know, with only the fields we use. So we don't use uh, Twitter, uh, JSON objects have like a potential, uh, uh, up to like 160 different fields. We, uh, not, uh, not all of them are populated, obviously, but we only need like 20 for the stuff that we do. So we, you know, there's no point in processing or opening these huge files when you can just process or open these little small ones. We can load all of the data in memory for fast processing. We only have one database, you know, with the tweet details. So whenever we pull a tweet that, w that for whatever analysis is useful, we can just query the database and get, you know, date, location, and all this extra stuff on it. And we used to have an Elasticsearch full text index on the whole textual data. We kind of deprecated that because the computer that we had it on kind of died and I haven't rebuilt it. But that allowed us to query it quickly, you know, subset our tweets quickly. Our, you know, bi-weekly GitHub updates are fully automated. So we run two bash scripts, you uh, one for moving data and pre-processing and one for putting copies of the data in the Git folders and committing. We update the data set three times a week. So, and this is one of the scripts that does that. It takes 20 minutes to run. I still call them manually. I didn't want to, you know, schedule jobs, but I, I, I'm kind of weird about this and I like the control to that level. But if I go on vacation, I can just put a cron job and get this done automatically. Our weekly Sonoda updates, because we update the full data set every week. We're in version 19 as of this week. Our Oslo, mostly fully automated. We have the scripts to do the bi-weekly updates. Uh, we run those, and then we upload all of that to Sonoda. You manually kick off the R visualization updates, which is just a script that calls all these R scripts, that calls the files that live on the, heart, on the, on the file system, aggregates them, and does all this visualization automatically. And this whole process of uploading the data set takes around 40 minutes to run. Why? Because we still load the full data set file on memory just to remove duplicates, which we're kind of moving away from in, in our next version of the software. So it takes 40 minutes to run, which, you know, all the work seems like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. It was a lot of work at first. I used to, the first couple of releases, I spent several hours doing this until, you know, you keep automating, you keep, you keep making things, your life easier. So what do we learn? You want to automate things as quick as you can. You want to, don't be afraid of fixing bad processes. 
try to avoid them. Obviously, everybody makes mistakes. Or you will just do stuff inefficiently when you're doing stuff quick. One-time expensive computation costs are always good in the long run. Having these flat files with everything in them, uh, just subset it to what we need. It's a one-time expense that uh, when you load that file, it's a lot faster than loading, you know, the full JSON object. Not everything needs a big database. Not everything needs the newest, most complex tools. We're not using anything super fancy. Uh, and always share with others, you know, publish your code. We have our code available. Publish the data. We have our data available. Be nice to the community. If you post an issue, I try to respond it. I try to fix it. If you post a request, I try to address it. A lot of the data set features that we've been adding over time have been requests from people. You know, be nice, right? I mean, uh, help the community grow. So, yep, that was my spiel, acknowledgments. My PhD student, Ramya, has done a lot of this work. Uh, collaborations, this is mostly research collaborators that we have, people that provided data to us at the beginning, uh, people that are, you know, constantly helping us with questions. Some of the funding we've, really, we've received, 